Good evening. I'm Amy Gawad, the Executive Director of the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute, and it is my pleasure to be here with you tonight on the 10th, for the 10th annual Sandra J. Skolnick Lecture on Early Childhood Education and Advocacy. For the past 10 years, the Urban Health Institute has had the honor of co-sponsoring this event with the Maryland Family Network, and we're really looking forward tonight to hearing from nationally recognized clinical psychologist, Dr. Howard Stevenson. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the Urban Health Institute, we uh, work to strengthen and support community university collaborations that improve the health and well being of the city of Baltimore. I'd like you to learn more about our programs and events, um, such as the Bunting Neighborhood Leadership Program, um, as well as an upcoming book discussion we have with Thomas Apt next week, which will be um, in this room. And we have some materials in the back of the room, if you haven't already grabbed it, that outline some of our activities and will give you information about how to register and attend any of those events. It is now my pleasure to introduce Margaret Williams, the Executive Director of the Maryland Family Network. Hi, everybody. What a wonderful crowd. So exciting to be here. I'm so excited to hear Dr. Stevenson, and I know all of you are, too. Um, welcome to the 10th Annual uh, Sandra J. Skolnick Lecture. This lecture is named in honor of one of my longtime friends and mentors um, who was in Maryland a champion um, for the rights of very young children. And um, Really, she stands, uh, we stand on her shoulders um, as strong and capable as they come. Um, this is uh, the only event of its kind in Maryland that brings great thinkers, researchers, writers, um, authors, teachers, clinicians um, to speak on topics that mightily affect um, the very youngest among us and the people who take care of them, parents, child care providers, and others. Um, we select our speakers because they contribute um, to public policy that affects um, these children and their families on many levels. And they help shape our vision of what we can be doing uh, to improve our future and what's needed to ensure that all Maryland children, as in the words of my another one of my heroes, Marion Wright Edelman says, is a healthy start, a head start, a fair start, a safe start, and a moral start in life with the help of caring families and communities. Um, Maryland Family Network's mission is very simple. Um, we want to help there be strong families quality early learning environments, and a champion for the interests of young children. So that all of these, um, all these factors are critical for children to thrive. Um, this mission is not accomplished by our staff alone, um, wonderful staff that they are who work tirelessly. Um, <clears throat> but we are indebted to the many of you in this audience who work in the field of early care and education, in early childhood mental health, in maternal and child health, in public education, um, in research, and share your passion for families and children and make Maryland uh, a great place to grow up. Um, we also have a few other people to thank. Of course, Johns Hopkins, especially uh, of Maryland Family Network board member, Dr. Robert Blum, who couldn't be here tonight, um, also from Bloomberg Public uh, Health, uh, who helped establish this lectureship here 10 years ago. And of course, Amy Gawad, who works closely with us on many projects and um, made this evening possible along with her stellar team. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I do want to recognize a few individual, individuals who are here tonight with us who have been critical to our accomplishments over many, many years um, and who are essential to our continuation of work on behalf of young families. Um, Stephen Hicks is the Assistant State Superintendent of Schools uh, for the Maryland State Department of Education, head of the division of Early Childhood Development. Bob Embry is president of the ABLE Foundation, 
We've got David Hornbeck from Strong Schools, Maryland, a former state superintendent of schools. Um, Betsy Krieger, Karen Kreisberg from the Zanville and Isabel Krieger Foundation and the Change, a fund for change. And um, I think I've got, I have a few others on the list, but I haven't seen them yet, so I hope I haven't missed anybody. Um, there is a terrifically special group of people to me here tonight who are indispensable to the work we do because they do indispensable work. They are our ambassadors, they are our fundraisers, they spread the word, spread the gospel. They are the hands around the flame of family support and those are the members of the board of directors of Maryland Family Network. And a number of them are here tonight, just stand up all together. And I'll just say Brian Eakes, Mary Gunning, Judy Fry Jones, Jackie Lampell, Renee Spence, and Rich Wickland. And personally, I wanna say uh, thank you so much to our Champions for Children. Um, we call them champions because they invest, they made multi-year commitments to support the work um, that we do. They all have pins that look like this on tonight, and we could not do what we do without their support. Um, if you see them wearing these pins this evening, please thank them because they make events like this possible, among many other things, like a lot of our public policy work. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Howard Stevenson. We are so lucky, our number one choice for a couple of years now, finally was able to come <laughs> on this skull, for this Skolnick lecture. And um, we're really, really glad it worked out. In our line of work, there can actually be no more timely and, or urgent a message than the one I think you're going to hear about tonight. Um, Dr. Stevenson is the Constant Clayton Professor of Urban Education and Professor of Africana Studies in the Human Development and Quantitative Methods Division of the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also the Executive Director of the Racial Empowerment Collaborative, which is a research and program development and training center that brings together people at the local level, along with researchers, community leaders, other authority figures, families and youth to study and promote racial literacy and health in schools and communities. Dr. Stevenson is also the director of Forward Promise, a philanthropy that supports organizations to improve the health of boys and young men of color and their families to help them heal from the trauma of historical and present day dehumanization, discrimination, and colonization. Since 1985, Dr. Stevenson has served as a clinical and consulting psychologist working in impoverished rural and urban neighborhoods all across this country. And finally, since all that wasn't quite enough, he is the author of the book, Promoting Racial Literacy in Schools, Differences That Make a Difference. This was written to reduce racial threat re reactions to face-to-face -face encounters. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Howard Stevenson. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's, it's quite an honor to be here. And uh, on behalf of um, the folks who brought me here, the work that you all are doing is absolutely phenomenal. And in so many ways, doesn't always get um, the attention that it deserves. Um, and as listening to Margaret talk about um, the struggles of trying to make sure the world knows the beauty and the, and the awesome power that you all demonstrate in your service to young people and their families. I'm reminded of how this is true around the country, not just here, um, but still what you do in, in the, sometimes not in the light, is still powerful for our society and our children. So I'm grateful and honored to be here tonight. I'm also grateful to have seen some friends uh, here uh, who I haven't seen <laughs> In 20 some years, uh, Becky and her son, John, in the middle, um, who I knew only as a four-year-old, 
um, when he and my son, uh, when I was coaching them in soccer, um, they, they, we lived in the same, in Du Bois College House at Penn, and it's so good to see them. He's a lot different now than he was <laughs> at four years old. And since we are talking about zero to five, I needed to mention him. Um, but my oldest son, Brian, and he um, played together, and we, we actually literally won every game in the four or five-year-old division. It was just awesome. <laughs> And the two of them worked so well together, uh, and they could kick the ball so hard. I remember so hard that they would knock the other children out. Um, that's how powerful the two of them. I had to apologize to so many parents as the coach, uh, not just because we won, but because <laughs> we injured a lot of children. <laughs> um, or they injured a lot of children. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but um, at any rate. Um, Parenting is a lifelong acquaintance with helplessness. <laughs> as soon as you think you understand what it's about, you turn around and find out. This one that I brought into the world and have on occasion thought about taking out, <laughs> I did not do it. But when we have gotten to that space, we realize that there's something else that has to be in our lives to watch over our little ones and our big ones. When I first came to the University of Pennsylvania, <clears throat> I had dreams. I had dreams of studying race, because my research question as a scientist and a clinical psychologist, after spending lots of time doing family work with hundreds of families and hundreds of children, I wanted to understand, does it matter if race, or if parents talk about race to their children, does that help them navigate the world that is sometimes hostile? on occasion hostile because of their difference? It's a basic question. And over those years, I figured if I could find the colleagues mm -hmm. to help me in that process, uh, that we would conquer a big issue, perhaps, mm -hmm. in the fight against racism. I had dreams. I had dreams that I would come to the University of Pennsylvania um, with my colleagues and write, because in order to get tenure at an Ivy League institution, you have to write a lot. So I had dreams that my colleagues and I would sit together. I would learn about their work. They would learn about my work. We would go to coffee shops. We would look at each other in the eyes, and we would write together. I had dreams. But I also had dreams that I was going to study race. I wasn't going to study something else in order to make other people comfortable. But I knew that it might be difficult for them so I remembered shape-shifting myself, trying to make myself the non-threatening colleague, the kind and gentle colleague, with hopes that they would feel less threatened and they would come out of their caves, out of their offices, and that we could write together in the coffee houses. We could hold hands and skip, <laughs> skip into the sunset, sunset of academic nirvana. I had dreams. The problem was is that my definition of safety was not my colleague's definition of safety. No matter how much I shapeshifted, it did not make them feel less uncomfortable. And I was disillusioned, and I was sad about that. And after the first year, I was not excited like I was. And in the process uh, of getting ready for my second year, September 1st in 1991, I came across an article. I was reading through the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I came across an article called Another Country. You know how you're disillusioned, you just pick up something, you start fumbling through the pages, and you look at the pictures. And as I was looking at the pictures, I noticed that there were some people, some families. And they looked very familiar to me. And I said, interesting. Uh, I wonder what this article is about. And as I got more focused, um, I started reading. And in the first paragraph, it says, it's out there somewhere between the corporate capital of Wilmington and the neon brightness of Delaware's recreational shore, out there somewhere after the byways scatter and the pavement goes to dirt, is a place deep within poverty and at the edge of hope. I said, wow, this is a big deal. What is this place near Philadelphia? The first thing I thought of, though, was, man, how could they spell, misspell Delaware? I mean, it's just right down. <laughs> I mean, this is unbelievable. <laughs> So I'm more disillusioned about uh, this process. But as I began reading onward and looking through the pictures, I realized not only 
did I recognize uh, these faces. But the names in the article included people I had known, Burtons. I knew some Burtons. I went to school. I played Little League with some Burtons, right? And I saw this man here, works in, a, in the top left, works in a migrant camp in Dover, Delaware. So, well, that's not too far from where I grew up. I grew up in Delaware. And as I went down to this far corner, these folks here were in Milton, Delaware. And, and I realized all of a sudden, when this guy described another country, he was talking about my neighborhood. I grew up in Milton, Delaware. I, in a way, it was very eerie. How could he describe our neighborhood as a place at the edge of hope? That's not the narrative I grew up with. That's not the way that we sort of thought about ourselves. You ever been in a position where you don't have a lot of money, but if anybody calls you poor, you're ready to fight? That's how I felt. This is not my story. This is not my narrative. These are not my people that they're describing accurately. And so I decided when I went back to University of Penn that I was going to stop shape-shifting. I'm going to stop trying to be that gentle. And so I pissed a lot more people off. I spoke my mind. <laughs> and I, it, was, it wasn't singular. I, I allowed for a mutual pissing off. They could piss me off. I could piss them off. You know, that's what collegiality or marriage is like, right? <laughs> so um, in the process, uh, it was important for me to find my own voice. But I said something then that is still true today after 30 years, that um, I belong at the University of Pennsylvania, but I do not fit in here. And I don't know how many of you have ever been in a place where you belong, but you do not fit in. Our young people, our families, they walk into spaces all the time where they belong to be there. They're supposed to be there, but they do not fit in because the people look at them funny. They act towards them in unfair ways as if they have no right to exist. And so in the process, I define belonging versus fitting in as a way to navigate an Ivy League institution. And I define belonging as this Do I accept me? Do I accept my culture? Do I accept my competence? Do I have the skills to be a psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania? Yes, I can do that. I can write. I can do all of that, right? But fitting in is do I depend on others' acceptance of me or others' acceptance of my culture or others' sort of interpretation of my narrative? And in many respects, I think it has helped me from the very beginning to what degree do I have to fit in And I would argue on behalf of parents and young people, no matter how old you are, that shape-shifting is not healthy. Shape-shifting is not healthy. And we have to do it. We all have to keep our jobs for reasons to take care of our families. But I would like to make the argument that it's not healthy. This is my family. If you you can look at the picture here, you'll see my parents are the only ones smiling in this picture. Um, they were very good. They didn't always get along, my parents. They, they were great for public moments, though. They loved the limelight, and they were very talented in the limelight. Um, this is my sister, Christy. She's got a look on, on her face like, oh, look, a white man. That's what she's got in terms of the photographer. <laughs> my brother, some of you know, he wrote a book called Just Mercy, very famous lawyer. Um, he's got that look like there's an injustice going on. <laughs> And I'm just the bouncer. I just, my job is to protect and fight whenever the time comes. There's a way in which in our family, if you grew up in Southern Delaware, anybody here heard of Delaware, by the way? <laughs> anybody here from Delaware? Where are you from? Wilmington, Wilmington okay. And it, it, Wilmington is a very different Delaware than Southern Delaware, right? There are two Delawares. People don't realize that. There's Upper Delaware and there's Lower Delaware. And people in Upper Delaware look down on people in Lower Delaware as what? Slower, slower, lower. lower. See? (laughs) Somebody else who's not even from Delaware knew that. (laughs) And uh, that's because Southern Delaware is different. It's it's like Mississippi. It's very, has a history that's rooted even in Brown versus Board of Education, believe it or not. The culture is different. The language is different. It's like the Deep South. Um, There were KKK rallies about two miles from where we grew up in Slaughter Neck. Um, My parents taught us where to be and where not to be. But they had very different styles about how to deal with racial conflict. Um, So it was like living in a multicultural family. 
My father was raised in Southern Delaware. He grew up in Southern Delaware. And his way with dealing with racial conflict was to have us in church 24 hours a day, seven <laughs> days a week. If anybody bothered us because of the color of our skin, because of our, our difference, he believed that you should pray for them, knowing that God would get them back in the end. He believed in retaliation. He just believed in a spiritual retaliation. <laughs> And you are not supposed to put your hands on anybody or sully yourself. God will take care of it. My mother's from North Philly. Very different. She believed you could put your hands on anybody at any time (laughs) if the situation called for it. She grew up in a very racially segregated neighborhood. She was used to running out of those neighborhoods because people didn't want her or her family or friends. And she was used to chasing people out of her neighborhood. It was equal opportunity running and chasing as far as she was concerned. She was more in your face. My father was one day in that great getting up morning. My mother was right now. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. (laughs) That's how they roll, multicultural family. Both of them African-American, but very different strategies on how you navigate the world. The people where I grew up in Southern Delaware, those folks who remind me of them, they helped to raise us. They thought, they thought we were their children. We couldn't go anywhere without their being in our business. Some of them, even today, if I go back, they don't, they don't care. It was a nice introduction. They don't care how many degrees I had or Brian has. They don't care you know, that I've been a part of a chair of a psych department and, you know, at an Ivy League institution. They don't get Ivy League. Some of them say to me, man, you've been in school a long time. <laughs> when are you getting out, man? You need some help? <laughs> They act like I'm in prison or something. <laughs> and you know how you got family, you can't explain to them you know, details about what you really do. So you just say, oh, I'm okay, I got it, no problem. <laughs> they helped to raise us, right? I went back some years ago before my father died. He asked me to go to the local supermarket, Georgetown, Delaware, to get some food. And I rushed through the process and I passed by the praying lady of our church, Mrs. Warrington. I didn't see Mrs. Warrington. Now, I don't know how many of you go to church, or see the black church on television in a movie. But everybody in a church prays. But there are some people, when they pray, they really, really pray. They know how to pray. When they pray, God comes for them quicker. Thunder and lightning comes out of the sky. And Mrs. Warrington was that person. In church, she was powerful. In public, she was demure. She was not that big. I missed her. I passed by her. On my way home, she called my father up. She said, Hobby, hey, what's up? There's something wrong with your boy. (laughs) What did he do? He did not speak to me. I get home, I bring the groceries. He said, what did you do? He said, Dad, I got got everything. He said, no, you did not speak to Ms. Warrington. Mm. So I had to call Ms. Warrington up and I had to (laughs) say to her, Ms. Warrington, I am so sorry, you're absolutely right. There is something wrong with me. And I had to listen to her for like (laughs) half an hour talk about Georgetown, Delaware and Jesus and what's wrong with the world today. Those are the kind of people that we grew up with in Southern Delaware. My mother came to Southern Delaware. She thought she had come to a foreign country. She did not understand the brown people, the black people, the migrant folks, the native folks. Because in public thoroughfares, when there were white people, she would see them bend their heads and, and, and move out of the way. And she didn't understand that. When she walked, she walked like she had attitude. She didn't really care what you thought about her. If people stared at her, she would stare back. Before we get into the supermarket, she would give us the talk. Don't ask for nothing. Don't touch nothing. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I don't care if all the other kids are climbing a wall. They're not my child. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Anybody ever get that talk? Anybody ever give that talk? Anybody ever give that talk on your way to this lecture? Anybody? (laughs) Don't touch me. Why does a parent give that talk? Just yell out real loud. Why does a parent give that talk? Try to keep your kids safe. Try to keep your kids safe. What else? What else? Take responsibility for your child. Take responsibility for your child. What else? Don't be judged. 
Don't be judged. If you mess up, they're going to look like I don't know what I'm doing. Absolutely. Some people say it's also because of money. If you don't have a lot of money, you touch something, break it. I don't have the money to pay for it. My mother wasn't concerned about money or reputation, but safety, right? We never acted up. She gave us a talk over and over again, but we never acted up. So why would a person give you the talk over and over again, knowing that we wouldn't act up? We were too scared to act up because we were in church 24 hours a day, seven <laughs> days a week. I was always afraid. My first sexual encounter, the whole church would show up right in the middle of it. <laughs> the choir would come out of one corner, singing Oh Happy Day or Amazing Grace or How I Got Over or something like that. And then the praying lady would come out of another corner, start praying. I couldn't take it. I waited till I got out of Delaware. It's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we never acted up. <laughs> well, why didn't she give us a talk? She gave us a talk, not just for us, but for us to understand how about they don't understand us. Does that make sense? And that is a particular kind of parenting. That is a particular skill we call racial socialization. Back to the question, does it matter if parents talk to their kids about race? Yes, it does. We know a lot more now. We know a lot more now about how those conversations matter in academic achievement. We know a lot more that those conversations matter in how you manage your anger, how children manage depression. We know a lot more now. But we don't know as enough because in some respects, when we did that early research, we were asking sort of relational questions. We weren't necessarily getting to the point of what does the talk consist of? What does a real talk look like? What should you include? What does it mean to be a parent who competently talks <coughs> about the politics of race, but gives their children something they could walk away with, right? Because parenting is a lifelong acquaintance with helplessness. Some of us would like to be with our children 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's called stalking. It's illegal. <laughs> and I know some of you have done it, but we can't always do it realistically. So what can we give our children that they will will have. And for many of us, it starts before zero. It starts when our children are in the womb. Some of us are crying about what will happen when they come out. Does that make sense? So we're in the supermarket. My brother, sister, and I, we're stressed. We're not interested in civil rights. We're not interested in anything around justice. We just want to get our food, go home. And some days, nothing happened. But on some days, there would be somebody who couldn't stand my mother's walk or style. And they would have to come up to her and do something or say something. And the worst thing that you can do with people who are, have very little money is after they buy their food, throw their food into the bag. And when that happened, it was on. A mother began to tell them who they were, who their family was, where to go, how fast to get there. That's my mom. Now, I, I, I say this story as an as a entry to ask you to tell a story as well. Um, both my parents were Christian. The difference is my father prayed before a racial conflict and my mother prayed after. <laughs> and those two strategies are how we have defined racial literacy, at least in our work. That is, sometimes you got to know how to pray. you got to know how to plan, prepare for racial encounters. You can't just roll up and think you got it. But other times, you got to know how to speak. You can't be quiet. You can't be silent. And I would argue that those two skills of preparing and speaking up are lacking in our society because we're too afraid to talk about these issues. And if you know the research on early childhood, if you know Walter Gilliam's work, you'll understand that we have to start early. We can't wait until children start speaking we're going to talk a little bit about that, but that's what we mean by racial literacy. So um, when we think of a racial encounter, for some people, people say, let's have a talk. Let's have a racial talk. But having a racial talk is, is like walking across the LA freeway uh, during any time, because it's that crazy. It's so difficult because many of our, what our bodies do, what our minds and thoughts are doing, interfere with our ability to speak, let alone process information. And so the work that we're doing at the Racial Empowerment Collaborative is we're saying, what happens in an encounter that's face-to-face -face and in the moment? Most people are unprepared for those moments because we haven't thought about them. 
we've thought about race as an issue of morality, because I'm a good person, I'm prepared. Or because I have done some good things, I'm prepared. But we don't do that for other issues. We're not prepared, I would argue, for face-to-face -face encounters. If you look at the worst scenarios that we've seen in our society with Trayvon Martin and others, most of the worst racial encounters have taken less than two minutes. And we haven't been preparing to deal with racial politics in less than two minutes. And the question we want to know is, are you prepared to navigate a racial moment that is stressful in less than two minutes? So when you see this particular image, what do you all see when you yell out? Just yell out what you see. Pretend you're home or wherever you are at the School of Public Health, you like yelling out. What do you, uh, what do you see in this image? Elephant, very good. You guys are ready for dinner. That's good. <laughs> what else? Confusion. Confusion. Like, like being pulled in every direction. Being pulled in every direction. Thank you. Blindfolds. How many of you didn't see the blindfolds? Okay. So I could keep this up for five minutes, and some of you still might not see the blindfolds. It says nothing about your talent or ability. Just want to say that. It's just that sometimes when we're confronted things, there's some things right in front of us we see and some things right in front of us we do not see. Does that make sense? So the reality of, of thinking about a moment, um, you could say, is very powerful in what we see and what we don't see. Anybody else see anything else? They're all white. They're all white. Very, very good. I wasn't going for that, but I, was, I need a better graphic. If somebody got a multicultural <laughs> graphic, I'll take it. I, I wasn't going for that, but that, you saw it. You saw it. It's very good. Stool. Say it again. Stool. Stool? Like stool. Yes. Okay. White coats. white coats. All right. All right. So you told me. What, what, they're, all, they're all by themselves. They're all by themselves. Okay. Not acting as a group. Thank you. All right, so you told me what you thought. Now tell me what you feel. Do you have a feeling about anything you see? The elephant. The elephant alone. is what? The elephant is asked to leave me alone, right? The elephant is asked to leave me alone. Is that how you feel? You feel, what feeling is that to be left alone? Okay, say again. Isolated. Isolated, okay, yes. Yes. Do you have a feeling about the fact that they're all uh, separate? Nothing's going to happen if they don't work by themselves. Yes. And in order to address the situation, you have to have the group effort. And what if the group effort doesn't happen and they stay isolated? Do you have a feeling about that? Makes you feel stressful. Stressful? Okay, great. Thank you. No change. And do you have a feeling if no change occurs? It depends on whether you're a hand or a hand or not. Okay. And do you have a feeling if, if that scenario doesn't get better between the haves and the have nots? Yes. Depends on who you are. Top and bottom. Okay. Bottom, yes. Okay. You know what I'm pushing you to do, right? Sometimes we look at this, we're thinking about thoughts. But other times we have feelings about thoughts. And in order to navigate racial politics, you must work as much here, if not more, than you do here. Does that make sense? So I'm going to ask you to tell a story um, similar to the story I told. And I want you to check yourself. I want you to notice what's going on with my body, what's going on with my thoughts, what's going on it, uh, with my emotions. And when we think about stress, um, we think about judging the world from our own perspectives, either or right or wrong. We're going to take a both and perspective to this image. But we're also going to look at the stressfulness you mentioned of the image as well. Let's say, for the sake of argument, how many of you would agree <clears throat> that the person who discovered a rope is going to be less stressed than the person who discovered a snake? Everybody agree with that? Okay. Let's say, for the sake of argument, um, 60, 612 snakes decided they're interested in racial literacy at the School of Public Health. And they all come into the auditorium and slither underneath your shares, interested, not very hungry because there's, you know, there's nothing. They don't smell food. They just say, I'm interested in understanding what's going on in the School of Public Health. And they're writhing themselves underneath your chairs. How many of you on a scale of 1 to 10 would be um, 
I didn't even say it yet. <laughs> She's already stressed. Seven or above in terms of stressfulness. Ten being very stressful. How many of you be at three or below? Okay. Why would you be at three or below? Are you a science teacher or something, a biology? No, I, I actually a nationalist, so it doesn't really Yes. Okay. So um, that's a good thing, right? Um, now, I don't know if you notice people looking at you very strangely <laughs> right now. There's something about you that, and some of you others, you probably lost some friends by admitting you actually like snakes. But the way that we think about racial politics is that some people run into them and they're at a three or below. They don't, they don't, not bothered. I got this. I've seen this before. When we look at the research on racial socialization, one of the key aspects of the theory we're proposing is that if you have seen the way that people are afraid of you, if you have seen the way that people might think they're better than you when they're not, if you've had some skill sets that allow you to interpret that that's not about you, it's about them, you're at a three or below. You don't, you don't, I've seen this before. I got this. I can still go to school. I can still process. I can still focus. I can still live. But if you're, some people respond to a racial moment as if it's like a poisonous snake. And at 8, 9, and 10. And when you're at 8, 9, and 10, your brain goes on lockdown. You lose peripheral vision and hearing. You make poor decisions because you don't have access to information. And the question is, in those two minutes, what's going on with you? And this is why we're interested in police encounters, right? If you're at eight, nine, or 10, you're not your best decision maker. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. And we know the research on racial politics is if you see young people or adults of color and you're at an eight, nine, or 10, you're more likely to distort them as older than they really are, uh, larger than they really are, and closer than they really are. Tamir Rice had less than six seconds. If you think about it, if you, if you read the transcripts of the officer who shot him, he thought he was a grown man. He talked about his waist size. How can you do that? How do you think and take our children who are little and somehow make them not children? That is a form of dehumanization. If you have a 12 year old daughter who looks 18, you parent her differently. Do you not? You, you, you don't mind if, if you get caught for stalking for your own child who is an early mature. <laughs> Because you're worried that other people will come into her orbit, right? And this is the fear of parents of young people of color all the time. We have to worry. Is somebody going to misunderstand my little one? The beautiful work that Walter Gillian has done, we've become really close friends. He talks about implicit bias. Uh, and I'm sure most of you know this, but what grade do you think young people are about to be most likely to be expelled from school? How many of you would say lower school? Oh, I can't even fool none of y'all. <laughs> I go places and people still will say high school or middle school. It's pre-K. And we know there's a racial disproportionality in pre-K. So even when John was four, right, there's a way in which it's possible that a very well-meaning teacher might misunderstand him as a problem when he's doing nothing at all. And Walter says very clearly, this is an adult problem. This is not a behavioral difference. We don't have data that suggests that children at these early ages are misbehaving as a function of race. Russell Skiba has been pushing this for quite a while. So what do we do in the, in the context of that? So part of what we do is, I think, this ability to notice in a particular moment, how do I make a healthy decision? And the skills that we've taught young people as, as young as fifth grade is calculate, locate, communicate, breathe, and exhale. Calculate means, do I notice what feeling I'm having right now? Not thoughts, but feeling. And on a scale of one to 10, how intense is it? We're gonna go through a little exercise. Calculate. Locate is where in my body do I feel it? Because your body keeps the score. You probably read about that book. Where in my body do I feel that feeling? The more specific you can be, the more powerful you will become in noticing and well as managing your stress. I was at a Chicago Latin school several years ago, 7.30 in the morning with a group of fifth graders. I did calculate, I did locate. Before I could get to communicate, um, a fifth grader, Native American girl, uh, said, uh, I'm angry at a nine, that I'm the only Native American girl in this school. And she said, I can feel it in my stomach. It's like a bunch of butterflies fighting with each other, so much so that they fly up into my throat and choke me. Fifth grader, 
730 in the morning, clear, detailed. That's the way that you talk about. She knew her body. She knew herself. She knows what happens to her when people think of her as less than human. Communicate is what self-talk goes on and what images come to mind. And then breathe and exhale is the sort of process by which um, we bring back our brain online from 8, 9, and 10. How do we get from 8, 9, and 10 to a 5, 6, or 7? That's the goal. So just uh, for the sake of um, a lesson, I'd like for you to talk to a partner next to you. Just pick one person next to you. And I'd like for you to, to come up with a story uh, about messages I heard or encounters I heard while I was growing up. And this is where I would, I would say that the racial socialization research is important. <laughs> What do I remember about the messages or encounters I had as a child growing up, whether it's from family or neighborhood? And I want you to talk to that partner for about two minutes, and then I'm going to say switch, and then your partner is going to tell you. And then I want to kind of see if you can notice yourself while you're talking or notice yourself while you're listening, and then uh, we'll share it just briefly. Got it? If you can pick a pair, go for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, question. Did you notice anything about yourselves while you were talking or listening to your partner? And we don't have a lot of time, but I, I want to know, did you notice anything in your bodies? Fidgety? You both were fidgety? Wow. Um, thank you. Anybody else? Notice anything physical? Yes. You, say again. Okay. You noticed that. How did you notice that? Okay. All right. Somebody else. Notice. Okay. And I had felt the first time was like haywire. Like I felt it in my shoulders, so I could not really carry a lot of my stress. But yeah. it's been, it's also been in the course of like six months that I've done this a few different times for different things. Mm -hmm. And it's comforting that I feel calmer. Okay. Like I felt like it was still like being put on the spot to talk to a stranger. Yes. But it wasn't being, it wasn't, it didn't have a lot of the extra component to that. Okay. And calm, let's say on a scale of 1 to 10, how calm or how calmer? Probably 3 or 4. Okay, cool. Did you feel that calmness anywhere in your body? Um, not at the moment. I'm physically pretty uncomfortable. I've had a headache all day. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little off. All right, okay, cool, cool. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I had some thoughts and feelings about what the next two minutes were going to be. What but, feelings, for example? <sighs> I would say, like, I, I, like I, it, presents, it presents as anxiety, so I'm not really wanting to attach that word to it. Sure. But, but you feel that, whatever you call it, yeah, anywhere in your body? Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure. Sure. So one way we think about this work in terms of noticing, and thank you for sharing, is what do you notice? That it's in a culture that doesn't talk about race, um, it's natural for people not to notice what happens to them when a racial moment happens. So the more that you can actually notice what's going on with you. And then admit it to yourself is courage. Saving the world is great. Um, but noticing yourself is better because you can't get to that other thing until you do that. And so even if you notice I feel shame, even if you notice I feel guilt, even if I notice I feel joy, all of those, the ability to notice means you're, in some respect, becoming more literate about how the politics of race play out on your hearts, minds, bodies, and souls. We know more now about how racism affects our health. I don't talk about racial socialization anymore regarding morality. Good people 
do the damnedest things. Right? Morality is not a reason. We don't, and we don't pick people just because of character. We don't, we don't judge algebra teachers because they have a good character. If they can't count, we're not hiring them in our school district. Right? Oh, they're really good people. I want you to hire them. Could you please? They're really good. Nicest people in the world. Can they count? No. Well, they, what are we talking about? And the same goes applies to racial moments. Why should we get people engaged in our professional activities of childcare if they are good, but they don't know, they're not competent at navigating a racial moment. Does that make sense? So how you notice what's going on with you is a particular courageous set of skills. And to notice, anybody see anything in their head when they talk? They see any images? Yes. I, we're talking about childhood, transport me back to childhood. I was describing um, growing up out, right outside of New York City. Yes. Mm-hmm. And my parents grip me in my hand tighter as you walk down the street because the neighborhood is changing. Yeah. Uh, not having a real understanding of mm-hmm. what was there. I saw the whole thing and my chest felt tight. Yes. And my stomach felt upset. Now, I'm going to say great. But I don't want you to think it's great. I feel great that you had those experiences. Okay. It's great that you noticed that you had those experiences. Because uh, Wade Noble says this great saying, the, the worst kind of oppression is not to know it. So when we think about racial politics, we're really talking about trauma. We're talking about how much has trauma affected our inability to speak, to act, to prepare, to speak up when the moment comes. You ever have that deer in the headlights moment, that one social justice moment where you say, I'm going to do it this time. And instead of standing up, you fell down. That's what we all do. Or deer in the headlights, you just froze. And you wish you had a second opportunity. Did you see yourself in the images? Yeah, as a child. Did you see any other detail, other people? I just saw you. That's cool. Right. How many of you, if you said now that what you talked about felt like you were right back there in that spot? Now that that's what we call trauma <laughs> in a big way. Or if it was a wonderful experience, it's something that you could utilize to help you navigate the traumas of the day. Does that make sense? Something historical could be both tragic and triumphant. And how do I excavate it so I can use it for the politics of the day? And today we need the skills to navigate the racial crazy that's happening all around us. I, was, uh, I have two children, two boys, a uh, 28-year-old, his name is Brian. And my youngest son is Julian, he's 14. And we're not going to talk about how that happened at all. <laughs> That's none of your business. <laughs> but um, both of them I think of as my little boys in the sense of I cannot, uh, in some respects, ever feel like they're, no matter how old they get, do I ever feel like they're safe. Because I'm not sure that people will see them. They, I still see them as my babies. And so... Um, My youngest would talk all the time. And one day we were folding laundry, uh, which in and of itself is such a strange and rare occurrence, I should have known something bad was going to (laughs) happen, that um, on the screen of the television was Trayvon Martin's parents, and they were crying. And he got glued to the TV. He had a 1,000 questions, and I could not stop him. He was eight at the time. And so I'm just going to share the conversation, because I felt inadequate. I felt helpless as a parent to navigate because he was driving the discussion and I wasn't. And that was a very different space to be. It's sad that we don't care, you're not our kind. Yeah. It's like, we're, 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 we're better than you and yes. there's nothing you can do about that. And if you scare me or something like that, I will shoot you because I'm scared of you. Exactly. And the right the problem is is that because of bad images on television, the way that people are trained and raised when they grow up, they're they're raised to be scared of black boys and black people. And it's not right, it's not fair, but you know, and it's one thing to be scared. People get scared all the time, but it's wrong to take that fear and say it's okay to kill somebody or hurt somebody. 
And I don't, I don't like the idea. And that's why daddy gets mad about it sometimes. But that's also why mommy and daddy want to teach you so that if anybody is following you, that you need to know how to talk to them and to stand up for yourself, yet not, not underreact or overreact. You know what underreact means? Like, it means like you pretend um, that nothing's yeah, happening. Yeah. What does that mean? Like, you know something's happening. I'm pretending, oh, it's fine. Yeah. But overreacting is like yelling and saying, oh my God, I, 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 I it's just like, you're panicking. Yes, exactly. And that, and, and, and partly that's because even with cops, some cops who are not, um, and all cops are not bad. Most cops know exactly what they're doing. But some cops might be, um, have been caught being afraid of African-American boys and then try to be difficult or, or like, rough with them and treat them as if they're doing something wrong. And after, you know what, after, um... Then it's okay to ask for help, yell out for help. Um, but initially you want to, you know, you want to treat everybody right. You always do. I noticed that. Um, but it, if somebody's It's not the same you, for everyone else. It's, it's not, not the always the same. No, you yeah, gotta be Yeah, because people can disrespect you. Exactly. And, I uh, think that you're... You don't... You don't look... You don't look like you're... It's like they're saying that you don't look right, uh, so I guess I have the right to disrespect you. Yeah, and that's what we call, and this we call that racism, that some people, a lot of people, unfortunately, will look at a boy who, like Trayvon or like you, uh, with a hoodie on and see that maybe you're, and believe there's something you're going to do wrong. Instead of other people who wear hoodies, they don't look at, at them the same way. And uh, that's wrong. And that's why daddy wants you to be safe. And that's why... So you mean like... When when you said other people, you mean like if if Trayvon was a white, um, that he wouldn't be disrespected like that. We don't believe he would be dis disrespected like that. No, not not in that neighborhood where Trayvon went. Um, and I think sometimes. He, yeah, I think they heard on the news that he was in a white neighborhood. Yeah, well, he was in his neighborhood. He was in the neighborhood where he lives on his way he, home, yeah. going home. So in a way, it's not. It's not even wrong going through someone else's neighborhood if you are not doing anything. Um, but the other thing is true that even black people can look at other black people as if there's something wrong with them and other boys. And that's just as that's a problem, too. We're just as concerned as if anybody says, I'm better than you. Really? Anybody who looks at another kid and says, I'm better than you or you're out, you're more dangerous or you're a criminal because you're black and you're. A child or a boy, that is wrong. It doesn't matter who does it. And, Dad, I need to stop you there. What? So, remember when we were at that, invited me over at the swimming pool? Um, mommy told me that there was a guy disrespecting us. And they were like, oh, the two guys. Yes. And they were like, what? Yes. Well, what are you doing? They were like, they were looking at us like, well, what are you doing here? Yes. And then, and then. They're, and then they're like, I thought this place was white people only. Is it's that like, what he said? Well, I don't, I don't, well, he looked like that. He's like... No, he had he, a he, look. I don't think he said that, according to mommy. Like, I think. no, it looked it looked like... He probably looked like he's like, huh? Because what are these was, guys doing? What are these guys doing here? Yeah, he had that disposition, that yeah. attitude, and you were the only persons of color there. So what else could it be? It makes you wonder, what else? Why is he saying that? And uh, um, I just want you to know that that's somebody else's problem. That's not your problem. That's their problem. Don't you ever think that you're less than somebody else. And no matter how people treat you, if they treat you bad, it means they don't know how to treat people right. You understand that? Don't you start thinking there's something wrong with me. Um, I must be bad. No, that ain't, that ain't got nothing to do with somebody else accusing you. They're wrong. They're misguided. They're messed up in the head, not you. And that was the problem with George Zimmerman. His parents didn't teach him how to deal with his emotions. Didn't, didn't well, maybe they him. did, but he did the wrong choice. Well, it's possible they could have talked to him, but I don't think so. The way they talked about their son, 
they think that... Uh, One minute, uh, George Zimmerman, you mean? Parents, yeah. Yeah. What did they say about him? Well, I think they basically felt that he was justified to, to, to follow and What stop. the... Yeah, I think that's wrong. I think that's that's one wrong. of it. So they're saying he has the right to follow a black kid, get in a fight with him, and shoot him. Well, I don't think they're saying that he had a right to. to I think they felt because he was scared of him, they had a right to shoot him. But what? they they do not in any way see what was wrong about what <laughs> Trayvon Martin did. I mean, what uh, George Zimmerman George did. That was what's wrong. Yeah, that's the. Uh... Their parents must be so, so, so sad. You think that that you can't go places, and uh, daddy's gonna be behind you 100%. You got good friends, and we're not gonna make sure you're in any place that you're not safe. We're gonna be be with you, but um, just in case. This doesn't happen a lot, but just in case, right? I did the same thing with Brian. I gave him the same talk. We call this the stalking talk. If anybody. I actually started to have images in my head in which I started to feel as if um, I could see somebody chasing my child. And so I calculated looking back that I was at a nine or 10 in anger and hostility because it's a recurring nightmare that somebody's going to misidentify e either of my children and I hope I'm there. In my image, I'm there, and it's my time, and my right leg is starting to quiver, shake uncontrollably, because that means I'm either running from something or running after something, and I can see myself wanting to intervene, and I lead the conversation, and there's a way in which uh, emotionally I'm not fully there because I'm shaken by the idea that somebody could see him as a monster. Same thing with Brian. I gave him the same talk. We call this the stalking talk. If anybody tries to bother my child, mm-mm-mm. What will happen? Well, they better run. Because what? I'm going to get them. See? <laughs> I'm going to get them. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, then they're going to get you because they might have weapons Well, or something. you know what? I'm going to call police, too, like I should. But I feel like I want to get them. But you can't. You got to be right. You can't just... You can't just they, go chasing they can be people. Armed. They can be armed. Yeah, you're right. You're yeah, right. They can you're be right. Armed. Yeah, you're right. I feel like I want to chase them. Plus, they can be an army or something. I know. I feel like I want to go get they them. Can, they can mess be. with my son. I don't like that. Mm. But I, I, you're right. You got to be careful, and um, you got to you got to be careful because you never know what some crazy people will think about you. And so, as long as you believe you're beautiful, like Daddy believes you're beautiful. And handsome, and mommy believes you're beautiful, and handsome, and smart, and you deserve to be on this planet just as happy and beautiful and smart as you want to be. You could do anything you want, baby. That's what my mommy said to me. You can do be anything you want, anything. Even when people try to hurt you, even if they don't like you, just brush them off, keep on moving. So the idea of wondering whether your child's going to be safe or not is a scary thing. We'd be crying every day if you think about the way that not only are they framing politics of race, but our children. It's hard to fear. It's hard to make sense of the absurdity that at any place the intensity has grown that someone might see your child as a monster. Um, but I do believe there's something we can do about it. I do believe that if we are able to, uh, in many respects, I actually believe the childcare sites and classrooms are the real fighting ground, the battlegrounds for fighting against racism in our society. I think in many respects, um, even if we don't end racism in our lifetime, we can end the negative health effects of racism on our minds, on our bodies, on our hearts and our souls, not just for ourselves, but for our children in this lifetime. And I also believe that um, if you can imagine that talking about race can add an hour of sleep over the next 10 years for your children, would you do that? Could you take the risk and, and be courageous enough to share stories like you did today and notice yourselves and act on what you notice or ask for help? 
We want educators, we want child care workers, we want parents, we want police officers, we want teachers who, when they see our children, that they see their own children because they won't overreact if you see your own child. That form of dehumanization that somehow distorts a 12 year old into an 18 year old is something we can work on. So I do think we need a racial literacy. And I do believe that um, we're going to need gun control as well in our hearts first. Um, so parenting is a lifelong acquaintance with helplessness, but we can still do something. We can tell our stories. And the proverb that we use throughout our work is the lion's story will never be told as long as the hunter is the one to tell it. The hunter is winning right now. So what is your story? Are you prepared? Um, thank you very much. We'll stop there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah. We have time for questions, I believe. Yeah. And there are mics uh, being distributed. Dr. Stevenson, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, it was a terrific um, um, presentation tonight. My name is David Hornbeck. Um, Hi, um, how are you? <laughs> terrific. You in Philly at some point, weren't you? I, I was trying to calculate whether you were there at the same time. <laughs> Yes. yes. Um, I, I thought your observation about needing people who know how to navigate racial moments um, was right on target. And what came to mind, of course, was a lot of emphasis these days on having people in classrooms. Uh, I, I haven't heard that particular language before, but no, who know how to navigate racial moments. And I was just wondering if you've developed or if you even know there whether a a, a sort of interviewing or po portfolio protocol exists mm -hmm. that could be used in human resources terms in school districts that uh, would be useful in identifying people either at the beginning of their uh, teaching career or principaling career uh, or after a certain period of time and professional development that could in fact increase the likelihood that we have people who know how to navigate those racial moments. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And in fact, I, I uh, run a center called the Racial Empowerment Collaborative, and we, we literally get two to three requests a week to do training for school <laughs> districts, uh, uh, police as well. Um, and part of the training is around skills development. So one difference, I think, from the work that we're doing is um, we're trying very much to focus on issues of skills. Um, and um, we have created certain measures, one around reading skills. How well do you notice what's going on with you? So the courage that people share to even let go of what was going on to them in just these few minutes. The question is, as a teacher, you know, do I notice what's happening to my body, my, you know, my thoughts um, when I'm caught in a moment with a student? Um, now, what Walter Gilliam calls uh, his language is egregious overreactions of adults in a preschool classroom is what I would consider stress, and I would call it racial stress. And so we have measures of racial stress to see to what degree. So some of the research on racial stress, we know that teachers who are um, stressed by racial encounters that have in the classroom, and uh, they're very different approaches, but some people get trauma, they get so frightened, they're at an eight, nine, or 10, um, they take it home with them in such a way, and they feel incapacitated. They don't know what to do, and they sort of shut down. You'll see this in discussions in, in different classrooms when an, a racial moment comes up. Huck Finn is a popular one that people find difficult. Teachers will tell us, you know, what if when students get upset by the language, what, what do they do? They freeze. They might freeze. <clears throat> they might run away from it. The question is, do you notice that those things are occurring? And so teachers can be stressed, but if they ask for help, they're more functional in navigating over time how well they can navigate this. Just as the young lady said, the more I do this, the better I get. That's the theory behind racial uh, literacy, that 
Um, the biggest problem is that we, we run from the moments of race um, because we feel so incapacitated. So we never develop the skills to actually uh, reduce our fear exposure. And, um, and that's why I don't take lightly when somebody actually shares something about themselves in front of an audience like this. And if they can do that, we know we can get teachers to share it in teams where they trust people and they're not going to be judged if they share, you know, um, you know, I'm frightened by Jamal, who's four, right? Those are real issues, but not attending to them is not a healthy process, I would say. So yeah, we, we believe not only can we measure how well are you doing in your reading skills, how well are you doing your recasting skills? The recasting is if I notice on my eight, nine, or 10, can I bring it down to a five, six, or seven? How well am I doing that in less than two minutes? And you know, the key is it takes practice. And I know some people say practice, practice. We're talking about practice. Yes, we're talking about practice. Y'all know that's Allen Iverson, right? <laughs> okay. Allen Iverson, best person in the world. I'm sure you were there when Allen Iverson was king, right? So Absolutely. But without practice, I'm sure people will not get better at this. We know that there are teachers out of even fear who will not take the risk of trying to figure out what's going on with them during these encounters. I actually believe they're, they're very much manageable, but not if people uh, don't attend to it, if that makes sense. Yes. Hi. Mm-hmm. Um, loved your talk. Thank and you. so my question is surrounding the last video you showed us of the conversation that you had with your son. Mm -hmm. um, I agree that fortunately or unfortunately, it's very important. But um, I also believe that similar conversations should happen in predominantly white families mm -hmm. or all white families. Sure. Um, and recognize that that conversation may have to change in that case. So I guess wondering what the research is or your opinion on kind of what yeah. that side would look like to support yes. all of this happening. Um, it's a great question. And I, because of time, I don't, it, does, it doesn't become clear that when I talk about this, that I'm talking about all families or all parents. And um, part of that is, we, I think we, you know, the, even in the parenting literature, we could talk about parenting stress. We all can identify with a sense of helplessness. But some parents don't have to worry about their children being misidentified racially um, in a certain way. And I think you need specific measures from that from a research angle. So, so measures of racial stress, I, I expect to find very different outcomes versus parenting stress. So you can have parenting stress, but parenting racial stress is different. But that does not say that, that white parents or other parents do not have stress about their child's difference, including being white and how the world might construe that. And I think since the last election, you can have parents stressed about who will people see my child as, on which side, whichever side that is. And that in itself can be a stressor, which I would say argues for a conversation. Um, if you think about as a parent, I mean, we all worry about you know, what would happen if my child said something in a public space that got misconstrued? Um, we do have one study, at least there's several more now, on looking at white racial socialization. El Eleanor, Eleonora Bartoli uh, out of Arcadia has written an article we've co-authored on that looks at um, the conversations in, in, a, in a qualitative study where the focus was on being happy that your child said nothing as opposed to said the wrong thing. Right. So some some might identify competence as not saying anything because it could disturb other people. It could cause harm to other people if they had the conversation. And I would argue the skill sets of how to speak up are still important for every child and and parents telling their own narratives and stories to help their children see the importance of that would be true for anybody. If that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yes. I was brought up by somebody who so, talked all the time. Yes. And one of the things I think, the only thing I think that you left out of that response then was that it is the same discussion because it starts with you. It doesn't start with the kid. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And if the parents aren't doing anything, they can't talk. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if they do, it's there's no set way. <coughs> because what you're trying to do is get in the head of the person, the kid. If it's somebody else, get in their head. And you can't. Sure. There's no one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight that you do it. It'll change depending on what you're talking about. The, I mean, his son was asking amazing questions, mm -hmm. making amazing, made in some sense, it made it easier for you to talk mm -hmm. yeah. because he was already yeah. showing, the, but it was also that your wife had been talking too. You know, it sure. wasn't, it was a continuous conversation. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, mm, it is all the time, it's around all the time. And sometimes we're up to it, and other times we fail. Oh, absolutely. I think you make an excellent point. Uh, Julian, uh, I mean, part of the research on racial socialization has even taken the idea that socialization happens from parents to children and ignored the fact that it goes the other way as well. But um, it would still be the same case that as you try to tell your story, what do you notice about yourself? You get emotional, you have memories. I would say the same thing. We have a project called Embrace. We, Dr. Rihanna Anderson and I developed it where we have parents come in with children and they, they, we've actually used some of the sessions from Blackish as a way to stimulate conversation between parents and children, but the parents have to have their own time first, and the children have their own time. And the traumas that come up for parents when they start having their own time, it'd be like, you know, you ever try to prepare to have that sex talk with your child, how you're gonna say that? <laughs> Similar stress comes around having the racial talk. I notice something happens to my body when I begin the conversation. I can't even finish the conversation. Um, and in this sense, um, children can drive the conversation based on what experiences they're having that their parents didn't even know about, right? So all I'm saying is go to it, go do it, try it, see what happens. And um, that's the better way to deal with the helplessness that we're talking about. And, and um, you will fail. I felt awkward. I couldn't even say the word white. I couldn't even say the word white people to Julian. Julian said, white people, you mean? I mean, it's like, it's like that in a way. Uh, and I study this stuff. So part of the issue of what you're saying is very right on. But I, I see it as a way to go talking more as opposed to talking less. Yes. So, Thank so you. As we, um, so I'm surrounded by boys in my family, right? And so I'm always having that conversation. Surrounded by um, what? I'm sorry. Boys, young boys in my family. We have a family full of very young boys. Okay. And so I'm always having that conversation with uh, nephews and my own child. And it's always at sort of that elementary school level. Um, when I have that conversation, my reaction is very similar to yours, that you get anxious and sometimes resentful and you uh, it panics you, it pains you. Um, but the reality of it is, is I'm also extremely clear um, that I'm giving a burden to these. So it's a necessary conversation, right? But also placing um, a burden on them, giving them some responsibility now to behave in a way that's different and mm -hmm. giving them an understanding of something that is going to change um, change their life and the way in which they behave in this world. And mm -hmm. so there's a level of trauma to that that feels very painful. And I've never been able to sort of um, decide what could be done to maybe lessen that or make yeah. their experience of having that conversation feel different or a little bit lighter. Sure. Um, because I feel like I'm handing them this big monster of a thing. Yeah. And what now does, you know, a uh, last conversation an 11 year old do with that, uh, mm. with that? Sure. I think um, a little different. I think you have more resources in the way you love your children that will balance out that trauma. And part of the part of the reality of parenting is, um, or whoever we t take on the role of parenting, um, is that you know the traumas that many of our kids experience happen without love. Imagine trauma without love. So in that sense, the question is, how much do I integrate love with the teaching about the trauma? And sometimes the only response is not just let me tell you how to behave, but let me tell you that you behaving or shape-shifting is not about you, it's about them. 
And that, that it's okay for you to be moving around, soulful, attitude, all of that is what God has given you. So how do I embolden that fact that this is because others are afraid as a strategy? The, the thing about parenting, though, is, you know, we burden our kids all the time. It's one of the few joys of parenting. <laughs> we don't get a lot of options. So, I, I mean, we scare kids all the time. Race is no different. I was asking those fifth graders, I said, do your parents ever say scary things to you? Um, and they said, yep. I said, what, what do they say? Well, they tell us, don't talk to strangers and don't talk to strangers. Don't take candy from strangers. I said, OK, cool. Anybody ever come up to you, offer you candy? He said, nope, <laughs> but we're real prepared for it. <laughs> so you could argue <laughs> that we say things to our kids all the time that have a fair amount of confusion and fear, right? Who's gonna come up to me, and offer me candy and take me away, mommy? You know, like if you really follow it. The same thing about the burden. That burden is sometimes we have to say, Daddy, Daddy's sorry that he even has to tell you that you live in a world that don't see you as human. So we, there's a mourning process to that. But I think if you have the love to navigate the trauma, and in our, in our ability, can you, we do, you know, we do, um, you know, good touch, bad touch with little children. We can do the same thing around when somebody treats your difference, whatever that difference is. What do you feel about it? Can you speak that? I want to hear that because that's your skill set. So uh, love, love conquers that, I think, balances that out. That's a great question. Somebody else? Hi, yeah. Um, I'm over here. Okay, My thank you. My name is Joyce. Um, thank you for your time and for sharing your stories. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about everything you were just saying in the context of I'm, I'm recently new into the professional working world and everyone wants to do racial equity, diversity, inclusion work. Mm -hmm. um, and as someone very smart said, you know, people are hungry, they'll eat anything. Mm -hmm. And so just thinking about how this work does involve practice, you know, it does involve showing that you're vulnerable and maybe not the expert in the room at times. And I'm thinking about how I would just love to hear your thoughts on what do these spaces look like where people can feel comfortable? Obviously, it is building relationship over time. But when we think about all of the programs for justice, equity, diversity, inclusion that are going around, um, what do you think about them? Especially when you're talking about like the battleground is childcare sites or sure. the home right. where there is that trust and that relationship. Well, I think, you know, I don't know if I can fully answer that, and there are probably people in the room who could answer it better, but I think there are these moments that are unpredictable that happen in childcare places that children bring up stuff, right? And I think um, my oldest said one day, he said, Daddy, how come there are no, at four years old, he said, how come there are no black Santa Clauses on TV? <laughs> I was happy as I could possibly be <laughs> that he even noticed that, right? But I'm saying in these childcare places, kids say the darndest things that never get addressed or noticed. And it doesn't mean the people should be blamed for that. It's just that could we have our antenna up? What could we make of a four-year-old's you know, conversation? Stuff that seems you know, um, cyclical or in some respects unrelated. Um, and Sesame Street did a wonderful study about, about some of this. So I'm just saying, can we have folks noticing? And it comes back a little bit to the parent issue of, before I talk to my child, do I have to, before I tell my story, what do I notice about myself in preparing to tell my own story? And that's where I think when we talk to our children, we gotta tell them our struggle, not just what they have to be burdened with. Some of the burden comes from, it's on you. But let me tell you what daddy went through when I was your age. Because many of us are trying to tell stories, the childcare, we're trying to give the hope and the heaven and the possibilities and everything's possible. And sometimes the kids are in the valley. They don't need a mountaintop conversation. <laughs> tell me when you were in the valley, mom. Tell me how you felt. Tell me how it affected you and your body. So I think there's stuff that we could, in, in our placements, do that. Um, I think the issue around Walter Gilliam's work is that even when we're well-intentioned, we still have not examined our racial unconscious racial bias around the movement of young people of color, that there's something is meant about that. And I think um, if we could say, if we, we put on the, the wall, not only you know the do's and don'ts, but some of the unconscious biases that we're likely to walk into, that would be a reminder for us to keep checking ourselves 
about when Jamal gets loud. You know, if he gets loud, what does that mean in the larger places that uh, he occupies? So that's just a couple of things that come to mind around professional spaces. Um, uh, we are funding some agencies through Forward Promise where we're looking at systemic disruption of dehumanization. That is, um, and so uh, for boys and young men of color. So we've actually funded some agencies who are doing work with the, the, the therapists and the social workers or the parole officers of the boys and young men of color because we think they are also oppressed and the narratives about them have been distorted that they pass on that hostility to the young people of color. And so an intervention around a professional space is how can we take care of the, of the workers, the frontline workers, so that they can be huma humane. If they're treated humanely, can they treat boys and young men of color humanely in prisons, right, and in jails? Because those are, are, the, are the first lines of you know, offense. One more? One more? Okay. So I, the mic, Doc Howard. Sorry, hey, that's Becky. okay. <laughs> I can't see these lights, man. That's okay. So I think kind of two points um, that you've touched on a little bit that I'd like to hear you elaborate. So I think about Brian and John um, at the age of four in pre-K, and some of the challenges that were experienced there in many ways. Um, you know, in hindsight's twenty twenty, but you know, just reflecting on um, the challenges. My memory of it is three brown boys, three brown boys' names on the board every day. They're the three brown boys that read, you know, all these sort of things. And the conversation I had with teachers around a little angry four-year-old redhead boy. And I kept saying, mine? <laughs> um, and what that means to, you know, so the um, calling out, being aware of behaviors in classrooms and things like that, where unintended consequences are messages being sent. I think the other piece is thinking about um, as caretakers, so I'm child welfare director in Maryland, um, as caretakers, the interactions we have with parents of the children we're serving and what parents bring. So I know for me, one of the things that I feel when I talk to John about his experience of race is my own um, guilt of I, I couldn't prevent it. And all the energy that I know I put into trying to prevent it, but knowing that you can't. And so I, I'm curious about you're talking about kind of the, we talked, you know, teacher child, daycare child, but the parent interaction with the adults as well. In the, the settings? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, um, when we were doing, you know, Head Start work, um, the, 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 the common concern was um, how parents were going to be treated in the process of even getting Head Start services. That, and, and in many respects, um, there's such a weeding out process that, that people had to come back bring all their children, take on SEPTA with the public transportation, and meeting after meeting, and you're judged by if you came to all those meetings, you could get in as opposed to, uh, it was like a, a weeding out process. And some of the parents commented on this all the time about being disrespected. Um, but I, I think, you know, um, even the styles of parenting, very different. If you saw my mother, mother's a very loving person. I tell this other story. My brother tells all of the loving stories about my mother. She was the most loving person in the world. I just like the cantankerous side of her. And if I had more time, I would tell that. But the point is, um, some people would misunderstand her style of parenting as if it did not have love in it. And she was stern in public because she was scared. She was stressed. As strong as she was, and I, I write about the fact that I appreciate her strength, um, there was a fear behind it because before we would go to the supermarket, she would she'd be pacing back and forth. She didn't know we were watching her. She said, these people are not messing with me today. I'm so sick and tired of having to go to the supermarket. So she's talking to herself and she's stressed. And the people in the public spaces, professional spaces, I want them to understand that. I want them to appreciate what it takes to get up 
and bring your children to these spaces, to be vulnerable, to, to put your lives in front of other people that you trust to understand that it is not easy letting strangers know about your business. And if they can't care for you in those spaces, then what are we doing? And I know some people do, but I'm saying if you're asking me, how do we make this better? Appreciate the energy it takes to bring and be vulnerable in these spaces. Um, and, and that's what I want our staff to be, you know. We think of affection, protection, and correction. Are those present in these spaces? Do I see love? Uh, do I see sheltering? Do I see a sort of accountability that goes both ways? And if we don't see that, it's, it's a different space, health space. Um, Lion's story will never be known as long as the hunter is the one to tell it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Stevenson. Thank you all um, for being here with us uh, for this very timely, important, and moving talk. And um, I hope you'll all come back next year for the Skolnick Lecture. Thank you all again. Thank you.